Our scripture uh, this morning is in Acts 1, verses 1 through 9. Please stand for the reading of God's word if you're able. In my first book, I told you, Theophilus, about everything Jesus began to do and teach until the day he was taken up to heaven after giving his chosen apostles further instruction through the Holy Spirit. During the 40 days after his crucifixion, he appeared to the apostles from time to time, and he proved to them in many ways that he was actually alive, and he talked to them about the kingdom of God. Once when he was eating with them, he commanded them, do not leave Jerusalem until the Father sends you the gift he promised. As I told you before, John baptized with water, but in just a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. So when the apostles were with Jesus, they kept asking him, Lord, has the time come for you to free Israel and restore our kingdom? He replied, the Father alone has the authority to set those dates and times, and they are not for you to know. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you will be my witnesses, telling people about me everywhere, in Jerusalem, throughout Judea, in Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. After saying this, he was taken up into a cloud while they were watching, and they could no longer see him. This ends God's word. Uh, please be seated. Well, I'm delighted to uh, have a chance to introduce to you our uh, brand new North Pacific Conference Superintendent, Greg Yee. Now, Greg is so new to the job that he told me that his plane landed here on Monday. Okay, this is his first week on the job, and this is the first church in the conference that he has preached in. Isn't that awesome? So let's show him our appreciation. We thought that uh, rather than me standing up and just kind of giving you a lengthy introduction, that I would actually interview Greg, and that would be the way we'd get things going here. So I have a few questions, and uh, Greg, if you'll just uh, share with us, uh, we'll encourage you to be honest and straightforward, even if it's not what we want to hear. Okay. I think some of that goes with the job of being a conference superintendent, <laughs> at least once in a while. Okay. Well, we know that you're new to the Pacific Northwest, all right? So tell us just a little bit about where you came from and what you were doing before you accepted this position. And also, if you'd tell us a little bit about your family, that'd be yeah, great. Yeah, absolutely. Let me just kind of start in the beginning. I was born and raised in Oakland, California, and uh, went to the University of California, Davis, where I met my uh, now wife of 23 years, Mary. And we got married a couple years out of school and made our way to Chicago, where we both did our graduate training. I went to Trinity Evangelical Divinity School for my MDiv and uh, ended up planning a church in the western burbs of Chicago. And after that was the uh, interim pastor for Glen Allen Covenant Church. Uh, back in 2003, I got called to be the associate superintendent of the Pacific Southwest Conference, which includes California, Nevada, Utah, Arizona, and the great state of Hawaii. So we have three kids. Our oldest uh, is making his way down to Azusa Pacific in a couple weeks here, Labor Day weekend. And uh, that's crazy that we've got one going off to college. Then my daughter, uh, she's 12 years old, just started middle school on Thursday. And my son just started third grade on Monday. Uh, he's eight years old. And you're probably going to be... Woo! You're... Sound like a lighthouse. <laughs> Don't get close to the rocks. So you're probably, um, boy, I just completely forgot what I was going to say. Let's just move on. Let's just move on. All right. So for those who are not familiar with the structure of the covenant denomination, tell us a little bit about what a conference superintendent does. So um, our home mission field in the United States and Canada is split into 11 conferences. So we represent Oregon, Washington, Idaho, and Montana. And so conference superintendent oversees uh, the mission uh, strategies of the collective family of churches in, those, in that region. And so we also uh, help oversee uh, the credentialing process of all of our pastors and uh, just basically help resource all of our churches to do what you do best on the front lines, uh, to be healthy and to be missional, and to be going forward. Great. Mm -hmm. And the North Pacific Conference is Oregon, Washington, Idaho, and Montana. That's right. Yep. 
Great. Right. And I know it's new to you, so you'll have fun traveling around that big, vast region yep. and uh, finding out about us. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about your vision for the North Pacific Conference and maybe a few things that you're passionate about? Absolutely. So again, uh, just having churches uh, that are healthy and missional, um, churches plateau, churches run into issues, and we're just wanting to make sure that all of our more than 70 churches are moving into greater health and greater missional life uh, together. Um, being in it together is a big deal as a covenant family. And so uh, I realized that uh, a lot of our uh, covenanters, we've done a lot of growing in the last 20 years, uh, since 1993 when we started to plant a lot of churches. That means a lot of our people don't even know what it means to be part of the covenant. Uh, how many of you uh, grew up in the covenant, like Cascades and Chick and know Chicago really well? Come on, raise, raise your hand, hand. raise your There's hand. There's a few of you out there. Raising, you. You're not raising them very high. Come on, let's okay. see those hands. Okay, okay. Yeah, and so if that's an accurate reflection, a lot of folks don't know uh, what our collective family is doing. And so how to be a bridge in this next season in the conference and communication strategies and getting into our churches and our members uh, coming together. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Um, any uh, impressions about the Pacific Northwest so far? I mean, I know you've only been here for a week, all right? But, it's gorgeous. Uh, it's absolutely gorgeous. Isn't it beautiful? It's beautiful. Lots of water coming from a very drought-stricken state. <laughs> is it like when I go like, oh, yeah. it's that. Okay, maybe it's that. Okay, so I can't pound when I preach. Okay, that's good. Um, it's beautiful. Uh, people have been super friendly. Um, all the pastors have been great in reaching out to me in this transition. And so we're just really excited to jump in. Traffic? Yeah. Lots of traffic. The 405 is insane. <laughs> what is up with that? You thought when you left California you were going to get away from and traffic, And there's like no right? good reason. It's, it's no, yeah. yeah. It's just, so, it's, anyway. Yeah. All right, well, Greg, we believe in full disclosure uh, here, no, okay? Really so okay. I do have to ask you this question. Tell us what your favorite sports teams are, all right? Can I plead the fifth there? No, no okay. we're not okay. going to okay. get okay. away okay. with okay. that. So I was born and raised in Oakland, so I'm a big A's fan. We're not off to a good start. But before I came up here, I did buy an M's hat, so, okay? Is that all right? Step in the right direction. Okay, so I'm not a Raiders fan because they broke my heart as a kid when they moved to L.A., so I became a Niners fan, Ooh. but I'm teachable. I'm teachable, okay? I hear next to Jesus that the Hawks are really important, so I'm teachable, All right. okay? All right. And sorry for not bringing the Kings up here. I tried my best to bring them up from Sacramento, but yeah. Well, we're going to wean you away from uh, rooting for the 49ers this year when they get thumped a couple of times by the Seahawks. Uh, how can we pray for you in making this transition? Um, it's been fun just to jump into all the newness of uh, this role in this region for me. But just pray. Just pray as I connect with pastors and churches. I look forward to connecting and for us to collectively be praying and, and exploring and discerning uh, what God has for us in this next season as a collection of more than 70 churches. And pray for our family. Uh, my wife and my younger two um, will still be in California for a few months. And so just being a part, you know, and having uh, the kids uh, quite young and going through some pretty important stages. We're trying to do our best uh, over, you know, Skype and all of that, but it's not the same when you can just hug your kids and be with them. So, yeah. Well, Greg, we're delighted that you're here. Welcome to Camp Thank Covenant. So we're thankful that you came. And on your very first Sunday on the job, you came down and spent it with us. So Absolutely. we look forward to you bringing the Word of God to us. Thank you. Thank you, Keith. Well, it is indeed uh, a, an honor and a privilege to be with you all. I was told I have 25 minutes, and I grew up in a Baptist church, and I come from a culture that doesn't really look at the clock, so I apologize ahead of time if uh, we go a little long, but we'll, we'll definitely try to keep it to 25. Uh, this morning, uh, I want us to do something a little crazy. I want us to actually uh, do an overview of the first 11 chapters of Acts. Okay, so we read a few of the verses in Acts chapter 1, but we're going to actually kind of like push through and, and look at 11 chapters in Acts and really find kind of our, our landing point on, uh, in Acts 11 uh, for uh, hopefully some, some applications for us today. Um, if we could just show the first slide. Isn't it true that, uh, that our beliefs always lead to action? Isn't it true? 
that, that if you believe something, it, 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 it naturally leads to doing something, right? But oftentimes, we have to make sure we kind of check at a different angle, right? That we have to look at our actions because they clearly reveal what we truly believe. Amen? Okay. So a lot of times we can say we believe something, but in fact, we don't really believe it because it's not really showing up in our actions. Now, this is a really silly picture in this next slide. It's something that I uh, saw in, I think it was Popular Science, or po it couldn't have been Popular Mechanics. So Popular Science um, gets to know me a little bit. I'm a little nerd that way. Subscribe to both those magazines. Um, Popular Science, and, and this was a picture of um, some studies that are doing, do, being done about um, methane emissions from cows and as they relate to global warming, okay? And I know it's a little crass, but, um, but it's just interesting, right? Because you see a picture like this and you ask yourself, you know, it doesn't matter what side of the argument that you're on, do you really believe that there's global warming? Okay, if you do, then it will naturally lead to some actions. The car you drive, you're not gonna drive this big old, you know, four miles per gallon, whatever it is, you're going to drive something that's more gas efficient, right? You're going to recycle. It may be influence your politics. It may influence what you invest in. It leads to actions. Well, you could say, well, I believe in global warming, and it's really harming the earth and harming our future generations, but you know, you know, I don't do any of these things. Do you really believe it? Do you really believe it? Now, here are my children uh, here. Uh, this was at the end of the meeting in Detroit, and we were at the Ford Museum. Uh, they took a really silly picture before this, but I decided to do the nice one. And, um, you know, if I truly believe that it's important for a father to be intimately involved, to be connected to, 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 their, to, his, chi to his children, and if I truly believe that that really helps them grow up and, and gives them a deeper sense of, of their Heavenly Father, and, 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 and helps in, 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 in their socialization, and, and helps my daughter, uh, you know, that, that, that relationship with my daughter is, is very important, then I will be very closely involved with my kids. But if I look at my calendar, and I'm looking at my calendar, it's like, you know, uh, my, I haven't been to a game in a month and a half, and I haven't really sat down for any length of time with them. I haven't really sat down and just kind of rolled around the ground with them. I haven't do I really believe it's important? Well, this morning, I really want to ask the question, what do we truly believe was accomplished on the cross? What do we truly believe came out of the cross? What, what do we truly believe in the power of the gospel work? As we look at the trajectory of the gospel, the trajectory of the gospel work in Acts 1 through 11, I want to put forth to you that the gospel work that that which we appropriate in our personal lives and how we live it out here at Covenant Church is powerful, is absolutely powerful, absolutely life-changing and world-altering, absolutely community-transforming, absolutely will flip your family and flip your life upside-down powerful. But I think that if you're anything like me, sometimes we're in this place where we don't really believe that. That sometimes we're in a place that, that we treat the gospel, the power of the gospel, the work, the, the trajectory of the gospel, the work of the gospel, like a dog where we just kind of keep it in its kennel. And once in a while we'll take it out and say, okay, be free in the dog park, you know, a controlled area certain boundaries, but when this is getting a little uncomfortable or it's pushing me past what I'm, I want to do, I'm going to put you back in the kennel. But rather, I want to put forth that here in Acts 1 through 11, we're going to see this crescendo, this, this growing sense of the power of the gospel work pouring itself out into crazy places. And I believe that that is the trajectory that your life is on, that our lives are on and that Ken Covenant Church is on. God, we pray that as we open up your word here, that you would bless it, 
that you would allow your Holy Spirit to move in such a way to touch us in, in, in places that, that we need to be touched, to, to bring to mind things that we need to, be, uh, to, to think about, and to reaffirm the call that you have upon our collective lives here at Kent. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's uh, open up our Bibles. and uh, Again, we're going to be breezing through Acts 1 through 11 here, so just keep your Bibles right in front of you or keep your phones right in front of you. And I start us out here. All right. That will keep me at the pulpit then. Okay, so Acts 1. So we, here we have Jesus uh, right after the resurrection, and he has appeared to over 500 people, right? And uh, as he is appearing to these 500 people, he is preaching for 40 days about the coming kingdom. And as he's doing this, he gets down to uh, verse 7. He said, It is not for you to know the times or dates the Father has set by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. He puts forward the Great Commission once again, and he's taken up into the clouds. They bring in Matthias uh, to be the, the twelfth disciple, and then we come to chapter 2 the birth of the church, Pentecost. So the Holy Spirit comes down upon the church, all those gathered there, crazy stuff being understood with different languages, and then the, the fire that was on, the, on each head and the whirlwind that was blowing through the, the room there. The church is born. And then Peter begins to preach out of the, uh, the prophet of Joel. And in verse uh, 17, in the last days, God says, I will pour out my Spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. He's preaching here, maybe one of the first sermons in this, this new church. And he's saying, there is going to be a day that this new thing is going to pour out in such a powerful way. And right now, your sons and daughters will begin to speak of it. And your young men and your old men will see visions. Church, what are you envisioning? What is God placing upon your heart about what is happening in this place? What is God placing on your heart about what is happening around the world? And how Kent and how you are to respond to that. And so we see uh, later in that chapter, verse 41, those who accepted his message were baptized, and about 3,000 were added to their number that day. Amazing conversions that are going on. And in a very familiar passage, they begin to, um, to see this, this incredible, radical outpouring of generosity within that community where people were selling their property and making sure that nobody was in need. Radical, radical discipleship. Then in chapter 3, Peter heals the crippled beggar, right? It says um, uh, in verse uh, 6, he says, Silver or gold I do not have, but what I have I give you. In the name of Jesus of Nazareth, walk. This guy had been, been, been uh, uh, crippled his entire life been carried down to this gate to beg for money and there Peter and John were and he reaches Peter reaches out his hand and he grabs this man this man's hand and he says walk and his ankles begin to strengthen and he begins to step up like he's never stepped up before it's an amazing scene and he gives testimony to what has happened in his life he went to the temple and people like were amazing oh my goodness you were the crippled guy this momentum is building stronger and stronger. In chapter 4, Peter and John appear before the Sanhedrin, before this religious body that there was just this dead orthodoxy that was there. There was no life. And as they uh, appear before the Sanhedrin, they are sent to jail. But as they were sent to jail and as people maybe were concerned and, and maybe it felt like a defeat, it says that more were added to their numbers to 5,000, including men and women, on, or, uh, women and children on top of that. The momentum is building. When they saw the courage in, in chapter 4, verse 13, of Peter and John and realized that they were unschooled, ordinary men, they were astonished and they took note and these men, that these men had been with Jesus. 
amazing things were being poured out. In verse uh, 31, uh, and they prayed, the place where they were meeting was shaken, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and spoke the word of God boldly. And they went on to sell their possessions and distribute it amongst anyone who had need. Crescendo, getting louder and louder. What's the first word that begins chapter 5? What's that? Now. Other translations might say but. It's a contrastive conjunction in the Greek there. It's basically saying something has gone on prior to this, but I'm about to describe something else. And this is the very familiar story of Ananias, Sapphira, and here we have the first time in recorded church history, the first couple that was not all in. Right? And I'm not going to go through the whole story, but they basically... Uh, pretended, they, 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 they had this front of, of, of being all in, but they truly weren't all in, and they were judged for that. And it's just a place where when I read this part of Scripture, I just pause and I go, God, am I really all in? You ask us to love you with all of your heart, soul, mind, and strength, to leave nothing, to, 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 to leave everything behind and to give you everything. Have I done that, God? Am I in the trajectory of, of the other disciples that did do that? Or am I in the trajectory of this couple, this first couple, that was not all in? But even though this couple was not all in, the, 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 the momentum continued to build in chapter 5, verse 14. Nevertheless, more and more men and women believed in the Lord and were added to their number. As a result, people brought the sick into the streets and laid them on their beds and mats so that at least Peter's shadow might fall upon them. It was growing and growing. Chapter 6, we have here uh, an account uh, of, of some conflict happening between uh, the Grecian widows and the Hebraic widows. Uh, the, the Hebraic widows were not being served in the, in the same way. There was a, an inequality. There was an awkwardness in their relationship as they were bringing groups that were formerly not together, together. And so, but mission always does this, right? Whenever we go to different places, and as we, as we follow Jesus into different places, he will always bring us to these places where it's going to be awkward, that it's going to be different, that we have to change things up a little bit, that we have to sit down and talk to each other. Now, I'm just hearing awesome stories about what's happening here at Kent Covenant Church. A long history and a long legacy of reaching your neighborhood in awesome ways. And in reaching uh, different language groups and becoming more and more multicultural and what you're doing in the Congo and your partnerships in other places. Awesome. Celebrate that. But we know that when we go to those places, when we allow ourselves personally to go to those places, it can often be difficult because it's different. But that's okay. Do not be afraid of what's different. Do not be afraid of conflict because conflict is natural and normal. Do not be afraid of disagreeing because disagreeing is natural and normal. It's how you disagree. It's how you go through conflict. It's how you talk to each other. It's how you come to the table to troubleshoot. And here in chapter 6, we see that as they're running into this tension in the community, they go out of their way to make sure that things are put into place so that there is a, a lifting up of the one that feels slow and that there's an evening out at the table so that they can see each other face to face. That's a longer conversation, another sermon series, but I'm going to leave it at that. Don't be afraid of that. It's in the trajectory of the gospel. Let's look at chapter 7. Stephen begins to preach to that religious establishment as well. Um, he uh, comes to the end of that in uh, chapter 7, verse 51. He says, You stiff-necked people with uncircumcised hearts and ears, you are just like your fathers. You always resist the Holy Spirit. And so he, he says this radical thing to the religious establishment, and in the verses to follow, he's stoned to death. Now, I want to make sure that, that we're feeling that kind of in the same way that, that, that uh, they were feeling it back in that day. If you can imagine, you know, uh, one of the top uh, church leaders in this day, you know, besides Keith, um, you know, maybe, uh, you know, like a Rick Warren or something like that, okay? Rick was preaching at, you know, let's say Rick was preaching at some event, and he was really challenging 
uh, the Western church, and, 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 and he, he's preaching something like this, and then he goes out to the parking lot, and a, and a bunch of uh, pastors don't like what he's preaching, and they're packing heat because they're in some state that pack heat, and, and they shoot him. You know, I mean, it, it's, it's, it's that crazy, right? And, and if you could think of all the tweets and, and Facebook posts and the news that would go, I was like, oh my goodness, somebody shot Pastor Warren because they didn't like the message that God placed on his heart and, and, and what he was saying about us, the church. And Stephen was stoned for that. And, and the split that would happen in chapter 8 where the church in Jerusalem and Judea was, was persecuted. And here in chapter 8, in the, in the original language, we have this sense of, okay, an, another chapter is coming here. And indeed it is, because as it follows the great commission of Jesus Christ that he put forward in chapter 1, uh, verse 4 in chapter 8 says, Those who have scattered preached the word wherever they went. Philip went down to a city in Samaria and proclaimed Christ there. When the crowds heard Philip and saw the miraculous signs he did, they all paid close attention to what he said. With shrieks, evil spirits came out of many, and many paralytics and cripples were healed. And get this, so there was great joy in that city. Okay. They, he was down in Samaria, a place that was often on the outside. These were not people that were insiders. These were people that, that, that didn't get along with those folks there in Jerusalem. They, they always experienced life separately. People from Jerusalem avoided Samaria when they traveled, right? And so here, the gospel comes and the, the momentum is growing so large that we have this description that there was great joy in that city. Oh, don't we all pray that as we continue to live out and live in the trajectory of the gospel here in Kent, that that would be the description here of Kent. That the church was so alive and there was such radical movement into the different communities here in Kent that there was great joy in Kent because of what Jesus is doing there. And so it moves on. Uh, Philip uh, meets with the Ethiopian eunuch, and then chapter 9, the great persecutor of the church, Saul, uh, has this incredible encounter with Jesus on the Damascus Road. He uh, is converted, and that is a radical thing. Uh, then we get to chapter 10, and Peter is at Cornelius' house, and he's on the roof to pray at the noon hour, and he has this vision of, one, of those uh, animals that were once unclean, and now they're clean, and he's saying, no, no. But uh, the, God says, it is a new day. Jump into the trajectory of the gospel work. It is a new day. And then we get to chapter 11. Okay? Here we have yet another uh, a change uh, in the language there that is saying, okay, we have another chapter here, and it's moving to Antioch. And I want us just to... Um, uh, to learn a little bit of the background of Antioch here. Uh, Antioch was the fourth largest city in the Greco-Roman world at that time, behind uh, Rome and uh, Alexandria in Ephesus. It was the political center there in the Eastern Mediterranean world. Um, you know, Rome was up here and they needed to make sure they had kind of a, you know, a capital of sorts, a satellite capital there in the eastern part. It also was a commercial center um, there were um, uh, trade routes that went east, and, and uh, there have been uh, fairly recent archaeological findings that um, the Chinese were, my people, were in Antioch. Uh, so it was a big commercial center. It also had this Sin City reputation. I mean, when you think of Las Vegas, it's like that times 10. You know, and that's the kind of reputation that it had. It also was a very small area. Uh, if you could look at this picture, I think you have it, the next one. Um, I tried to do a two-by-one-mile swath of what is around Kent Covenant Church. So you're the little flag there on Google Maps. And so it was just a two-mile-by-one-mile mile area. But um, because the Romans really love their fountains and public spaces, it's conservatively estimated that actually people only lived in 60% of that two-by-one. Okay, so that area to the left, sorry, that's a little dim, 150,000 people lived in the 60% of the two-by-one then. And technology was such that they probably didn't um, build buildings higher than about five stories. And so um, uh, what is understood here is that you think of a crowded city like New York 
and uh, their people per acre is about 37. I mean, if you've been to New York, you just think, man, this is a really crowded place, right? 37 people uh, per acre. In Calcutta, it's 122 people per acre. There in uh, Antioch, it was 195 people per acre. Very, very crowded. Okay, public space I mentioned, 40%. It was very filthy. It had no sewer system. It was kind of bucket patrol. They didn't have soap that was readily available at that time, so people were just kind of unbathed and nasty and stinky. And there was a lot of disease uh, that was there in the capital. It was very common to see people with sores or coughing. Uh, the, the, the estimated lifespan was quite short. Half of the babies died, so there was a very high uh, mortality rate. And it was a very, very tense place. Because it was, it, was, it was cosmopolitan, it was metropolitan, it was a trade route, it was a political center. They had estimated 18 walled-off areas for different groups of people, different cultures, different ethnicities. Because the tension was so high between the different groups that they had to build different, uh, uh, different communities, different neighborhoods in this little space. You know, kind of like the Chinese were over there, and the Swedes were over there, and the Mexicans were over there. Eighteen different communities. Now, what's very important for us to know is that as the Apostle Paul uh, came up from the minor leagues, he, his first team, his first place to play, was here in Antioch. Okay? Now, if you, had to, you talk to any athlete, if you're an athlete yourself, you always remember your first place. You always remember your first team, right? It has very special memories. And so Paul was called up from the minors. He's, he's getting to be a full-blown uh, uh, apostle here. And, he, and, and ministry begins to happen. And, I, you know, as I'm playing this out in my head, I immediately think of uh, Ephesians 2, verses 14 to 16. Okay? It says here up on the slide, for he himself is our peace, who has made the two one and has destroyed the barrier, the dividing wall of hostility. It goes on to say, and in this one body to reconcile both of them, God through the cross, by which he put to death their hostility. You know, when I used to read this passage, I used to think Paul was just writing to the church in Ephesus and he was just kind of using, you know, good poetic language because, you know, he's an He's, he's a disciple, he's an apostle, and he he's, writes a lot of letters, and so he wants to make sure people engage it. So he's talking about dividing walls of hostility, you know, just kind of flowery, poetic language. But then I go back to Acts chapter 11 here, and I'm like, no, Paul saw actual walls. And when the trajectory of the gospel as the church was being born there in Antioch, I'm thinking of Paul right there in the middle of this little city, so crowded, diseased dirty, really a stretch for people. And he sees these walls and he's saying the gospel is so strong that it could actually break down the walls of these 18 neighborhoods and we could all come together and be the church and experience the power of the gospel work. So what does this mean for us this morning? What does this mean for us this morning? I want to say that we have to just take personal account first. We have to just stop and say, do I really believe, do I, do I truly believe that, that this is appropriated in my life? If you're anything like me, you might be struggling with some stuff. Stuff that you have just been waving the white flag and you're just saying, ah, I don't know. This thing that I, this addiction, my marriage, this relationship that I know that's not right, this thing that I do when the doors are closed, this thing that I've tried to, to just conquer for so long. Do you truly believe that when Jesus said it is finished, it's not just that he was breathing his last breath, but he's saying that the weight and the power of sin is gone as I, as I hang here. That it is finished, that, that, that everything that is broken and everything that is diseased and everything that is separated and everything that is difficult, that this trajectory that we find ourselves on brings us into new life. 
Do we believe that? It says in Isaiah 43, forget the former things. Do not dwell on the past. See, I am doing a new thing. Now it springs up. Do you perceive it? I am making a way in the desert and streams in the wasteland. And in Revelation 21.5, and Jesus says, and he sat, and, and the, the prophet says, and he that sat on the throne said, Behold, I make all things new, and said unto me, Write, for these words are true and faithful. My friends, if, if there's something there, I urge you to bring it into the light of the trajectory of the gospel work in your personal life. Grab a pastor, grab a trusted friend, Grab your spouse, grab your best friend, bring it into the light and say, this cannot be a part of my life anymore because I am being held back from this life of feeling full in Christ, feeling free in Christ, feeling new in Christ. Bring it into the light. For us as a church, certainly I personally am excited where this uh, takes us as a family of over 70 churches. I'm excited that uh, we can partner together as a conference within four states and say, God, what are you, where are you taking us? Where, where is the Samaria that we can just bring great joy in those cities? Where, where, where is the Antioch where we can just jump into the mess of this world and show that, that your gospel is strong enough to break down walls of hostility? I'm really looking forward to partnering with you and, and the other uh, covenant churches in our area to see what is going on. But today I'm excited about what this means for you and for your church family. This is a day of worship that we come here together. And so I just invite you, do not leave here as one who's just heard something and just leave the same, business as usual. But leave here as one who has come into the presence of God and said, I desire to jump into that trajectory. I desire to be part of that. I desire to give you, Lord, my heart, soul, mind, and strength. just invite you to, to bow your heads at this time. And I just want to give us a little space here to just do some business with God. Whatever the Lord is placing on your heart, be a face, it could be a thing that you've been connected to. I just invite you to, to give that to God. And say, Jesus, I desire to come into your light to jump into this trajectory of incredible crescendo that is happening in my life. Or perhaps some of you have just been holding back. You, you've been a, a great spectator, a faithful spectator. But God might be saying to you, hey, I have put some incredible experiences and gifts in your life through the Holy Spirit. It's time to get off the bench. It's time to jump into this body so that the body could be full and, and not handicapped. Maybe that's what God's saying to you today. God, we thank you so much for the account in Acts 1 through 11 that we can read but not just read, be inspired by. In 11 short chapters, we see this amazing crescendo, this amazing outpouring of your Holy Spirit, God. That when you say for us to pray, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. You're real about that. You're serious about that. That the kingdom is indeed being established right here in Canada. We're seeing it before our very eyes. Thank you, God, for asking us to join you in that. 
God, I pray that we would make it our confession today for our faith anew in you. That we believe that you are a God of great power in our personal lives, in our marriages, in our family, and in this world. That we will not domesticate your gospel work. We will not slow down the trajectory that it is on. But that we will take a step of faith in this morning and grab your hand and jump. We thank you, God, in the powerful and precious name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.